Great. Let's see. Well, welcome to uh, 102. I guess we're supposed to pretend it's Wednesday, or it is Wednesday for you. It's not for me. It's Friday. Um, and let's see. Last time, actually, I'll say it a few times just because it's fun because last time hasn't occurred yet for me. Um, so that's really just a prediction. Um, last time we looked at, uh, at control systems. And this time we're going to come back and um, make things a little bit more complicated. We've been studying feedback so far um, in a static context. And now what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, feedback systems where the forward operator and the feedback are dynamic. And this is going to be going to introduce some really interesting uh, new complexities and all that sort of stuff. So that's what we're going to do uh, today, is dynamic analysis of feedback. Um, the brief story is something like this. It's actually really simple. All of the stuff you know for the static feedback case, so that's all these formulas like A over 1 plus AF, sensitivity, loop gain, all these things, which up until now for you are numbers, um, are simply going to become transfer functions. And that's, it's just that simple. Um, OK, so let's see how that works. Um, let's go to what our, uh, what, what our basic assumptions are. So up till now, the assumptions were that all signals were real num just numbers. They're just numbers. They are, there is no concept of time even. They're just numbers. And now we're, gonna, now we're actually going to have these signals be signals. In other words, they're dynamic. They change with time. So when you see a signal like U or E, sorry, then these are now functions. They're signals. They're functions of time. We'll assume that the open loop and the feedback systems are linear time invariant. And so they're described by transfer functions A and F. Um, we're going to overload the symbols A and F. Those were constants before. Now they're just transfer functions. The feedback equations then in the time domain are, are this. Is Y is E convolved with A. Little a is the impulse response of big A. And little e is U of t minus um, F convolved with Y, where little f is the impulse response of that feedback unit. So the first interesting thing to note is that in the scalar case, uh, what was just a, two equations, two linear equations and a, and a couple of variables, have now become two coupled convolution equations. They are very, this, is, this is a pair of coupled integral equations. Um, Again, if we were smart enough to understand coupled integral equations, and if I could say some, if I could tell you, well, what if A were this, and you could look at these equations and say, oh, yeah, no, that would be a bad idea. Or if I could say, well, what if F, F did this, and you could look at that and say, oh, no, no, that's not good either, then we wouldn't have to do this, but um, we're not. So, okay. So the point is, it's actually just difficult, even just to solve these coupled convolution equations is not easy at all. Not only that, the new com th there's a new complexity here, and it's actually a very interesting complexity in feedback. And let me explain what it is. It, now there's a temporal complexity. And the temporal complexity here is this. It's that um, everything you do with you is going to actually affect the entire future output, right? So, which is not the case for the static feedback uh, case. So whenever uh, anything you do with you is going to, Current time is going to affect the future, and so it's uh, it, it's complicated. Okay, so our standard feedback system uh, looks like this, and uh, all that's happened here is actually just a handful of symbols have changed. A used to be a number, F used to be a number. Now A is a transfer function, and a, and F is a transfer function. U, E, and Y used to be scalars, and now they're actually signals. If we take the Laplace transform of everything in sight we get these equations. We get y equals ae, e equals u minus fy. That's just describing the feedback equations. And you eliminate u, and this is e, to get exactly the equations we had before. Uh, so here you are. The closed loop transfer function is a over 1 plus af. Okay? It's exactly the same. It's as if, it's as if these were sort of static. Uh, this was static analysis, so it's back right, right to the same thing. Same formula, A over 1 plus AF. A and F used to be constants. Now they're transfer functions. So, and that's exactly the point. So Laplace transform, when you take a Laplace transform, you turn horrible convolution equations into simple multiplication. And so we reduced, 
Basically, we reduced solving these coupled integral or convolution equations, which I don't think any person can actually look at and understand. We reduced it via, via Laplace transform to algebra. We reduced it to these equations, which are completely trivial to solve, and you get this. So you get A over 1 plus AF. When you see these equations, in fact, it's not even obvious that Y can be expressed as a convolution in terms of U. That's not obvious at all from these equations. Nor is what the impulse response from U to Y, which we'll call little g, is. But in fact, it's very simple. It is precisely the inverse Laplace transform of A over 1 plus AF. So that's the point. OK, now what's really nice about this is that Many of the things you already know for the static feedback case, many of the, all the, a lot of the intuition and all that kind of stuff, um, is going to hold here. Many, but not all. And there's going to be some new complexities. And we'll talk about what the new things are. So this is very much like the following. It's like in 101, understanding static analysis. So there's nothing but resistors, current sources, voltage sources, dependent sources. And you understand how all that works, and you learn all about it. And then in 102, we introduced the idea of impedance. And now it's as if all these same equations hold, except now instead of resistances, well, now instead of currents and voltages, you have Laplace transforms of current signals and voltage signals. And instead of resistances, you have impedances. And so all what's really going on is you have a giant circuit described by horrible convolution and differential and integral equations. And the same is true here for a feedback system. A feedback system is fundamentally described by some horrible integral equations. But this, this makes it much simpler. OK. So a lot of things are pretty obvious. Um, for example, we'll define the loop transfer function. It used to be just called the loop gain, and it was a number. Now it's the loop transfer function. It's AF. The sensitivity transfer function is 1 over 1 plus AF. This is absolutely the same. All the formulas are the same. Uh, interestingly, you have if delta A is small, you have things like delta G over G is S delta A over A. That says that the fractional change in closed loop transfer function is equal to the sensitivity times delta A over A. Now, this formula, which if you look back, is in your static analysis of feedback notes. It's the same formula. So all the symbols are overloaded. But what's different about this? Well, there's some really interesting things about these as opposed to the, same, the very same symbols appearing two lectures before. The difference is this. Here, these things are transfer functions. They depend on the frequency. So the sensitivity now is frequency dependent. That's going to be very interesting. It might be small for some frequencies and large for others. It has poles and zeros, and they, this all means something. Um, your forward feedback system. Your, forward, your feed forward system, A, is now actually, it's a function of frequency. So is, so is this uh, closed, loop, closed loop transfer function. So these are, of course, complex valued. And another interesting fact, this is going to turn out to be absolutely critical, and this is really the new element introduced when you look at dynamic analysis of feedback, is you have the possibility that, for example, G, this closed loop transfer function, is unstable. Okay? And that's not a sort of a, a, a mathematical pathology. It turns out that that is always a possibility. And quite frequently, it is closed loop stability that limits the amount of feedback you can apply. So that's, it, this, this is not a minor issue or a pathology. It's, it's a very, very interesting one. So what this means is, for example, large and small now mean complex magnitude. So if L is, a, is the loop transfer function, or you can take G or S, doesn't matter, um, it might be small for some frequencies and large for others. Okay? And if you want to know, the, for example, the, the, the uh, time response of the closed loop system, um, you can look, for example, if you like, at the step response of G, okay? which is the step response of A over 1 plus AF. So that's the, that's the idea. So, but if you understand all the other stuff about the sensitivity and all that sort of stuff, then it's, it's, there's, it's not that hard because it's the same formulas to understand what happens when these are transfer functions. OK, so let's, let's, look, let's do a simple example. Um, and it's an example where the difference between the static analysis and the dynamic analysis makes a huge difference. Um, and let's, let's take a look at that. OK, so here's our example. A of S is 10 to the 5 
over 1 plus S over 100. That's your, so uh, the, the DC gain here is 100 decibels. It's uh, 10 to the 5. It's got a pole at S equals uh, minus 100. And the uh, feedback uh, path gain is um, 0.01. That's minus 40 dB. So because the loop gain here, again at, uh, at, at DC, is 10 to the 5 to 10 to the minus 2 is 10 to the 3, that's pretty healthy. And that says that basically the closed loop gain should be about 100, which is 1 over F. Okay. So that's the, that's the idea. Um, incidentally, this uh, transfer function is not made up. This is an extremely typical transfer function of an op amp. So this, this is the, a typical transfer function for a real op amp, not with fake numbers and stuff like that. OK. Um, so the thing you observe is that the open loop gain, which is AF, oh, sorry, it's just A, is, is at DC, it's 100 decibels. The open loop bandwidth is around 100 radians per second. By bandwidth, all I simply mean is that if I plot the Bode plot of A, uh, it looks like this. The magnitude goes like that, and it starts rolling off. And it starts rolling off right at about 100 radians per second. That's where it rolls off. So that's the bandwidth. OK. And if I were to take the step response or the impulse response of this, or anything, I mean, I just want to characterize the time constant, the pole's at minus 100. So it takes, you know, on the order of to die out five time constants. Well, actually, this is a first order system, so it's, it's pretty accurate. Five time constants. And five time constants is um, 20 milliseconds, like that. OK, so that's about 20 milliseconds, um, approximately. OK, now let's work out the closed loop transfer function. That's simply taking AF divided by 1 plus AF. Now, these are transfer functions, which is to say rational functions of S. And you simply do the arithmetic or the algebra here and work it out. You multiply top and bottom by 1 plus s over 100. You kind of get rid of that and get rid of that. And you have 1 plus s over 100 here, like that. And you sort of collect terms, and you get this. You get 99.9 .9 divided by 1 plus s over basically 10 to the 5. Well, a couple of interesting things. This is the transfer function from the input to the output. And a couple of interesting things. The first thing is to note that it's stable. That, that, that's going to be important. It's also still, it's a first order system, just like A. Except for a couple of interesting things. The DC gain is 99.9. .9. We predicted that, that it was going to be about 1 over F. That's 100. And it is, in fact, 100 within three significant figures. We predicted that because the loop gains around um, 1,000. Um, so the closed loop DC gain is very nearly 1 over F, which is 100. The closed loop bandwidth, that's really interesting. Look where the pole is. It's at minus 10 to the 5. The open loop pole is at 100. This corresponds to, uh, this corresponds to uh, 1 over the pole here is 10 milliseconds. Okay? 1 over a pole here, here, is 1,000 times faster. So instead of settling in 20 milliseconds, it settles in, in 20 milliseconds, it settles in 20 microseconds. It's 1,000 times faster, OK? So here's something that you did not experience or couldn't have seen in a static analysis. We put a, about, the loop gain's about 1,000 here, OK? The gain went down by a factor of 1,000. We expected that, OK? But here was something shocking. The time constant, the speed, went up by a factor of 1,000. Because a pole that was at minus 100 is now Ten, minus 10 to the 5, OK? So the bandwidth went up, or the speed went up. It got faster, OK? So we can look at this now. We can understand a lot of this by looking at Bode plots of various things. So the loop transfer function is AF, is just AF. And that's 10 to the 3 divided by 1 plus S over 100. And so we can plot its Bode plot. It looks something like this. So in other words, up to the pole, which is 100, the loop, gain, uh, the loop gain is 1,000. Then the loop gain falls off. It's a single pole at 6 decimals per octave or 20 decimals per decade. Okay. Now, of course, you know <clears throat> with the loop gain what the critical point about the loop gain is. The question in loop gain, you get the benefits of feedback precisely when the loop gain is big. And how, you know how big? I don't know. It, let's take at least a factor of. 3, 5, 10. That's around here. Here's 10. So the loop gain 
is, exceeds 10 for omega less than 10 to the fourth. Okay? For low frequencies, it's 1,000. At 10 to the fourth, the loop gain has fallen magnitude to about a factor of 10. Now, 10 to the 5, the loop gain cross, it has a magnitude of 1. And below that, it goes, it, goes, it goes lower. Now, of course, in a feedback system, when the loop gain is 1 or less than 1, or substantially less than 1, then for all practical purposes, you get no benefits of feedback. Absolutely none. Right? No reduction in sensitivity, all this kind of stuff. Nothing. So just glancing at this, we can predict what's going to happen here, which is to say that the benefits of feedback are going to accrue to us at, for frequencies below about 10 to the 4th. For 10 to the 5, certainly for frequencies above 10 to the 5, you'll have no benefits of any kind to feedback. So that's the idea. And that's all based on just studying the loop gain. And what this shows is something very interesting. It, it basically says that now that these things are frequency responses or transfer functions, these ideas of, you know, oh, the loop gain is big, oh, it's small and everything, everything is frequency dependent. That, that's what it says now. So you can have a system which, in fact, has a sensitivity which is less than it's very small at some frequencies, and it could be high at others. And in fact, we'll see that's exactly what happens. So that, that's what happens. OK. So for this example, let's take a look at, um, at the sensitivity transfer function. This is just 1 over 1 plus AF. And you work out the details, and you'll find it to be 1 plus S over 100 divided by 1,001 plus S over 100. For S equals 0, that's DC. It's, one, one, it's about 1,000. That's about right, because the open loop, the open loop, loop gain at DC is a, it's about 1,000. So since it, this, this is a, that's a, a very small sensitivity. It says basically for this thing that the sensitivity to open loop DC gain variations is approximately nothing. Doesn't matter at all, and so on. OK, but it's a function of frequency. And if I plot magnitude of S, here's the picture I get. And it's a very pretty picture, and it explains everything. Remember that the sensitivity here comes up as something which gives you the benefits of feedback. Uh, if S is small, it tells you that the, partial, that, that the variation, sensitivity of the closed loop system with respect to the open loop system is very small. And you can see here that, that for DC, certainly up to about 10 squared, 100 radians per second, you get a really very, very small. Uh, sensitivity, 10 to the minus 3. Okay? Now, what's happening here is that the loop gain is falling off. That's here. As the loop gain falls off, of course, the sensitivity rises. And sure enough, right around 10 to the 5, the sensitivity goes to 1. Okay? The sensitivity of 1, by the way, corresponds to no feedback at all. It's 1 over 1 plus AF when AF is 0. So what this picture says is shows immediately that sort of somewhere over here for these frequencies, say less than 10 to the 4 or something like that, we get the benefits of feedback. Sensitivity reduction, all these things. For frequencies above that, we really don't get any, any benefits of feedback. And certainly for frequencies above 10 to the 5th or so, for all practical purposes, there is no feedback. There is none. Why? Because the loop gain has, fall, has fallen off to uh, well below 1. Um, OK, so this is sort of the, the idea. And as an example, if you want to look at uh, sensitivities, what this says is very interesting. These two express simply the fact that at DC, the sensitivity is about 10 to the minus 3. And this says if, you're, if, you're, if that op amp changes and its DC gain changes a little bit, like a few decibels, the change in the closed loop gain is immeasurable. It's a, it's a few thousandths of a decibel. On the other hand, if your op amp here undergoes a few decibels of change in gain around 10 to the 5 radians per second, then it turns out that will translate direct. You will see it as closed loop change in gain. There, because the loop gain is small, basically, and the sensitivity is near 1 in that case. So that's the idea. OK. So what you've seen here that's new is the idea that loop gain, sensitivity, all of these things are now functions of frequency. You can get the benefits of, of feedback in, for some frequencies and not others. Plus, there's this curious thing about how the, the closed loop system was actually faster than the, than the open loop system. But there's more. So there's more. And let me show you what else there is. 
Let's go back. Actually, before we do this, let's do something else. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a static analysis. And the static analysis is this. We have a static system. I'm going to put a static F here, like this. There we go. And what I, what I want to do now is just a, a static analysis. Well, static analysis says that the sensitivity is given by 1 over 1 plus AF. Now, suppose I told you that AF is 1,000, right? It says the sensitivity is about 1,000, and we know that means all sorts of good things. Now, suppose I told you that AF is equal to minus 1,000, okay? Well, let's see, what would you say? Um, you might say something, first of all, you might be nervous. You might say, well, that's, that's fishy here. I, I don't like, uh, you know, I, it's not right because it's, that's positive feedback. And I'd say, no, no, but we don't have the concept of positive feedback right now. And besides, what do you mean? And technically, the answer is something like this. In a static context, the difference between a, a loop gain of 1,000 or minus 1,000 is approximately nothing. The sensitivity, in this case, is minus 1,000. Oh, that's fine. All it means is now, I mean, it's just minus 1,000. It, 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 it works fine. There's nothing to say. There's nothing wrong with this. And in fact, what this quickly, you quickly realize is the following. For in a static analysis, if this feedback system works well, so does that one. Now, something's profoundly fishy about this because how could it I don't know. How, it just doesn't seem right. How could it be that changing the sign? And let me give you an, exa I'll give you an example. This from 101. That, that's a perfectly good example. Here's an example from 101. Here, I don't know. Here, there you go. There's a uh, there's an op amp circuit. Okay, R2, R1. The gain here from here to here is one plus R2 over R1. Okay. Now, this is an ideal op amp. Suppose I came along and I said, no, I don't know, let's see, let's do this, minus and plus. It's an ideal op amp. What changes? Hmm. Well, I switched, I switched the, the input terminals. Well, what changes? Well, I don't know, let's see, how does an op, ideal op amp work? Well, it, it says that the voltage between here and here is zero, oh, but that's the same as it was before. And no current flows into either of these terminals, but that's the same as it was before. And now we have this absolutely shocking Maybe no one ever told you this before. But the fact is that in a static analysis, an ideal op amp doesn't need its terminals labeled. Plus and minus don't make any difference. Okay. On the other hand, real op amps do have their terminals labeled quite carefully as plus and minus. And so the question is why? And the point is that there's no static anal there's no analysis of static systems that will ever tell you what the difference is, what happens when you flip the sign, when you flip the inputs on an op amp. This thing works perfectly well, at least on paper, with a static analysis. In practice, it doesn't work at all. And now you'll know, now you'll see why. Okay, so that was sort of my preliminary discussion. Okay, so here's our example again. Here's A, except we flipped the sign now. So we flipped the sign. The closed loop transfer function now, it looks exactly the same, except it's 1 minus s over this. Now notice that at s equals 0, you get the same thing. It's the gain is basically 100. It used to be, you know, 99.9. .9. Now it's 100.1. So it's the same. Huge, huge difference here. Huge difference. And the big difference is that. To you now, I hope this makes an enormous amount of difference. What happened when you flip that sign? What happened is that the closed loop pole went from minus 10 to the fifth to plus 10 to the fifth. But you know exactly what it means for a pole to change from minus 10 to the fifth to plus 10 to the fifth. A pole at minus 10 to the five refers to it, it means an exponential term that decays in a few tens of microseconds. That's what a pole at minus 10 to the five means. But wait a minute, this is a pole at plus 10 to the 5. And what that means is it's an, ex it's, an ex it's an explosively growing term. It's a signal which is multiplied by a factor of e. It grows by a factor of 100 
here in 50 microseconds. Okay, so in one second it's grown by a factor which probably is some absolutely enormous thing, some, some huge, huge, huge thing. Okay, Cert well, some unimaginable number. Right. So now you see, now you see what, now you, now you see a very big difference. Now you know why it is that in fact you cannot flip that when I flip the plus and minus sign, in a static analysis, nothing happens. Still 1 over 1 plus R2. If we include dynamic analysis, then immediately switching this thing around makes a huge difference. It flips a pole from minus fast to plus fast, from decaying fast to explo exploding fast. That's what happens. Okay. So, so the point is that dynamic analysis reveals uh, uh, reveals the big difference that a, a change of sign can make. Static analysis does not. It doesn't reveal any difference at all. There is no difference in static analysis. Okay, so now you've seen, uh, in fact, something that's going to be kind of a dominant theme for um, feedback. And what that theme is, is um, its stability. So stability is actually going to be, end up being kind of a big deal uh, in, in, in feedback. And we'll, we'll see that. We're going to see it over and over and over again. Okay. So now we're going to move over to um, control, which is what we looked at last time, also in the static case. Um, and we'll, we'll look at that example, uh, the heater example, the famous heater example, um, which, let's see. Yeah, so it's actually, I don't think it's 12. Is, if I got that right? Is that, it's 11. Well, it was close anyway. All right. So we'll look at that, that heater, uh, which I guess I can, I can say is a joke we looked at last time. But in fact, in truth, I'll look at on Monday. But anyway, I, remember, I, know, I, I know the example, so I'm OK. Just, we're supposed to pretend we do know here. OK. What we're going to do now is there, everything was static. This is this plate, and there was simply a gain. And that gain related the temperature of that plate okay, to the power of the heating coil. That's it. So alpha was a gain. It, it had the units of degrees centigrade per watt. Okay. Well, what we're going to do now is we're going to include the dynamics, the thermal dynamics of this plate. And the plate is going to have a transfer function, which is alpha of s, which is 1 over 1 plus 0.1 s, 1 plus 0.2 s, 1 plus 0.3 s. The poles are at minus 0.1, sorry, minus 10, minus 5, and minus 3.3. The DC gain is 1, meaning if you, this is a stable system, if you put a watt of power into that plate, it will eventually heat up 1 degree centigrade. Okay. But this captures the dynamics of the plate. It says that when you apply a watt to that plate, it does not instantly heat up one degree centigrade. In fact, because the poles are at numbers like minus 10, minus 5, and minus 3.3, this, of course, is the dominant pole. It says that here, th this dominant pole, it's, it's going to give us a rough idea of the, the, just the number of seconds it takes to, to do something about it. Minus 3.3 says the dominant time constant is 0.3 seconds. Well, using some rule of thumb, five dominant time constants, that's 1.5. We expect to see the response of the plate to have a time constant like a second or some second and a half, whatever, something like that. OK. So here is the step response of the plate. And it is absolutely consistent with our analysis just now from the poles. And what it shows, and, and it's important to have a physical uh, interpretation of, is very interesting. It shows this. The step response means that you walk up to the plate and you apply one watt to the plate. You turn the power on to the heater, one watt. It's at zero, which means ambient temperature. You apply one watt to the plate, and then you record the temperature. Okay? Well, eventually the whole plate heats up, and it heats up by one degree centigrade. Okay? That's sort of the static condition, or the, you know, it's reached static equilibrium. But what this says is that, in fact, to heat that plate up, it takes on the order of a second, second and a half, just what we predicted. Not only that, it's even more interesting. If you look closer over here, 
there's even a little bit of time when you've put a watt of power into the plate and basically nothing, almost nothing is happening. You, presumably here you're heating up the inside of the plate or something like that. You haven't seen it at, your, at the outside of the plate or something like that yet. Incidentally, this detail here is predicted absolutely by the fact that the relative degree, this has three poles. It falls off at 18 decibels per octave or uh, 60 dB per decade. And it has, a, it has three poles and no zeros. And that tells you something about the short time response of this. It says that, it, that the first term is something like t squared. And that says it's very flat here. OK, that's all. Okay. So in fact, people actually refer to this as dead time. In other words, you change the power into the plate, and ab basically nothing happens. Uh, certainly for 100 milliseconds, a reasonable description of what happens to the plate is nothing. It's, like a d it's almost like a delay. OK. And these numbers, although I made them up, are perfectly realistic. In other words, this is something very close to what a real plate would do. Very, very close. And the transfer function is quite close as well. OK. So what we'll do now is we're going to go back and look at our analysis. But now we're going to take the dynamics of the plate into account. And I think it's going to be pretty obvious what's going to happen. Uh, but let's, figure, let's just check and see, and then we'll talk about it. Um, so the ambient temperature is 70 degrees Fahrenheit. The, the desired temperature is 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Turns out that doesn't matter at all. Um, the disturbance, D, is a unit step. So we, we apply a, a, well, a disturbance power of a watt is applied. And uh, for T less than 0, the system's in a static steady state. So it's tracking at 150 degrees Fahrenheit. And what happens, of course, it's easy to, to explain. First, intu let's explain intuitively what happens. The power going into the plate is precisely the power required to hold the plate at 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay? At t equals 0, there's, an unknown, there's some disturbance power of a watt is applied. Maybe, I don't know, maybe some sunlight hits the plate and the total, the total energy hitting it or the total power hitting it, incident power, is 1 watt. Okay? Well, what does that do? That causes the plate to heat up. Okay? But we have, we're applying feedback. <clears throat> so as it heats up, our uh, proportional controller uh, is actually going to back off on the power. That's good. That's exactly what we want, because as you apply more power comes in through the disturbance, you need, you need to supply less yourself. So you think, well, I don't know. What could go wrong? Let's find out what happens. OK. So what happens, first the analysis. Um, if you work it out, you have an LTI system from a transfer function from the disturbance to the temperature error. That transfer function is this. It's alpha over 1 plus k alpha. That's what you saw in the last lecture. That's a number. Okay? If k is big, this number is small. That's in the last lecture. This is small. And this would tell you that if you make a big proportional gain, then in fact your controller is going to work really well because any sort of little errors, it will rapidly and aggressively correct them. OK. So that's a transfer function. And we can calculate, for example, its step response. And let's see what it is. Now, you have to understand what the step response is. It's a step response from the disturbance to the temperature error. So you really want to be down here. In the open loop system, here's the step response. You apply a disturbance. And of course, it's open loop. It doesn't do anything. It just sits there with the same power. And the temperature, of course, heats up. 1 degree Fahrenheit. Right? So that's what it does. That's fine. OK. Now we use a proportional gain of k equals 1. That says that for every degree Fahrenheit above the set point our temperature is, we will back off 1 watt on power to the plate. That's what this says. That's going to do the right thing. It's obvious, right? Because when the plate heats up here, we're going to, the plate is going to heat up. And we're going to say, uh oh, we're too hot. Back off on the power, and that'll drop the temperature. Anyway, the result of all that is that you get this curve here. And sure enough, instead of having a degree of error, you end up with half a degree of error. OK? And that makes sense. Well, then you say, as we did last lecture, if, if a proportional gain of 1 reduces your error to half a degree, why not make it more aggressive? Why not make it 3? That'll reduce our error to uh, one quarter. 
of what it is, 1 over 1 plus 3. And what it means is very simple. It means this, that as the plate heats up above the set point, we back off on the power we supply the, ha the plate by, that's for k equals 3, by 3 watts for every degree Fahrenheit the plate is hot. For every degree Fahrenheit the plate is cold, we're going to crank up our power 3 watts. Okay? That's three times more aggressive than this control law, which says that for every degree Fahrenheit hot, we'll back off a watt, and for every far degree Fahrenheit cold, we'll crank the power up a watt. We're three times as aggressive. Sure enough, the steady state effect is that our, we've reduced, compared to open loop, we've reduced the error to a quarter what it is. That's actually pretty impressive. Okay? Then you say, well, why stop at three? Why not go to 10? Well, you can kind of guess what's happening here. At 10, you already see this kind of bumping here. And this should give you a hint. You should know what this is. Um, when you see k equals 10, you start seeing this. What's happening here? Well, actually, the interesting thing is for k equals 10, look at that. The error is small, but the error is oscillating. And in fact, when you see this, you should, when you see this, you should start thinking. In fact, no one should even have to tell you. When you see this, you should be, you should be able to identify the presence of some poles. Here, these are complex poles. You see a couple of bumps, so I don't know what their damping ratio is. These are not exactly lightly damp poles, but these are, you, these are complex poles. When you see this, that's lightly damp poles. That's lightly damp poles. And sure enough, if you continue increasing the gain, k equals 10, here's a new plot. Here's k equals 12. At k equals 12, look at this. The temperature is actually it's actually oscillating and growing, and you should know immediately what that means. These are poles which are slightly into the right half plane. And sure enough, if you increase the gain further to k equals 15, what happens is the pole has become faster, but it's also growing rapidly. Okay? Now notice what this means. For k, it, in other words, if you use a proportional feedback system of k equals 15, it turns out that not only does the controller not work any better, it works far, far worse than the open loop one. It right? doesn't take you very long before the errors you're, you, you induce, induce are, are, much, are, are actually much larger than had there been no feedback or control at all. Okay. Um, now, what's really interesting about this, it can be under, it, it, this can be understood completely intuitively. And so let me, let me explain why this is. We'll come back and we're going to work out some things and you'll see some a characteristic polynomial and we'll factor it and there'll be poles and the poles will cross from the left to the right half plane, blah, blah, blah. Sure, that's the right way to understand this, but it's also possible to understand this, phenomena, this, this phenomenon absolutely and completely from an intuitive point of view. It's very easy to do. Um, let me explain that. Let's go back and, and just stare at this step response. This basically shows you what, what happens with that plate. And in particular, there is a delay. There's a delay. I mean, a whole before you, when you mess with the plate by cranking power up and down, there's a delay. Basically, there's a, I mean, basically nothing happens for 100 milliseconds. And even after half a second, only about half, the plate is only heated up about half the way it's going to be. Now, let's think about feedback. No equations, just intuition. You have this plate here, and somebody add some extra power to it. Okay? You first learn about this because you see the power, the heat temperature rising. And you think, great. For, uh, it's clear what you need to do at that point. It's too hot. You need to back off on, your, on the heat you're supplying to it. So you, you turn the power down. Now, if you have an aggressive proportional gain, what you do is you turn the power way down. And that is, in fact, exactly the right thing to do. You turn the power way down. All right? Now, the problem is that the effect of your turning it down doesn't show up for a while. In fact, it, certainly for 100 milliseconds, you don't see anything. You're still turning the power down. What happens finally is that the temperature then is brought, you've turned the power down so, so much that the thing is now cooling off and it's down and it gets back down to zero. And at that point, everything's great. Here's the problem. You haven't been applying a power, basically. You've been underpowering it for the last 300 milliseconds. And the thing drops actually now below. You've overcorrected. And then what happens is if you do this too much, it goes up and down. Okay. So 
Or to go back to our other example where maybe it's, it's better, probably a better way to explain it intuitively, if you go to a, uh, if you take, for example, the roll control, the automatic roll control in an airplane, what happens is this. You have an airplane flying like that. And what happens is there's some torque, external or interior, something like that. It's applied to the airplane, and it starts tilting like this. Okay? Well, what you do now, of course, is you, you crank up, uh, you crank down this aileron, crank up that one, or, whatever, or the other way around. And you apply a counter torque, and that tends to, to run it out at horizontal again, to push it horizontal. Now, it's clear that for a small proportional gain, this is going to work kind of well. If you make a pathetic little small proportional gain, it'll do nothing because it'll, it'll just fly like that. It'll be because you're just not putting enough torque to counteract it. Okay? If you put a really aggressive control gain, here's what happens. The airplane tips over a little bit because somebody got up and went from seat K to seat A. 22K to 22K. They went over there, and a very small torque is put on the airplane, and it starts rolling slowly, like this. This is picked up in the gyros. And what you do now is you, if you have a very large control gain, your ailerons now, you're only a degree off, and your ailerons go nuts, and they just go whump like that. They get a very big. And sure enough, that puts a huge torque, that puts a huge torque on the airplane. It's just a degree down, and very rapidly it moves it back. That's wonderful. And if, it, and if the story stopped there, this would be great. The story doesn't stop there. And the, the reason the story doesn't stop there is, of course, because there's rotational inertia in the airplane. So although, congratulations, you, you put it back in the right position really quickly, you di you, when it got there, it had a really healthy velocity, angular velocity, and it just keeps going. Now, then remember, this all started because somebody got up and went to one side and tipped it one way. Now the whole thing is, now it's tipped the other way. Okay? Well, you've got a hyperactive control system there that's very aggressive, and it says, oh, it's tipped the other way, and now the ailerons shoot, turn the other way, like this. And they put an extremely strong torque on it, and sure enough, very strong torque will turn the airplane this way. Again, it goes through the zero point, everybody's happy, but now it's still got a healthy velocity because a big torque was on it. And it goes, and you can actually understand very easily that it just, that this, it's going to go unstable. So basically, intuitively, Feedback plus inertia or delay. These are the two things. Inertia or delay with feedback is going to lead to instability. That's an intuitive idea. That's just pure intuition. I think it makes perfect sense. Um, OK, so that was actually just a preamble. And now we'll actually look at the equations and verify that that's kind of what we're seeing here. OK, so that was my total hand-waving explanation of what you're seeing here. And now let's actually do the, the 102 analysis. Well, let's see how this works. Um, it looks to me like if k is uh, less than 1 or so, the closed loop system is not much better than open loop. There's no point. If k is bigger than 5 or so, it starts oscillating. If k is bigger than 10, it's actually very undesirable uh, oscillation. So in this, in, this, in, in this example, maybe k equals 2 or 3 is about right. Now, the analysis works like this. The transfer function from d to e is alpha, alpha of s divided by 1 plus k alpha of s. And that's 1 over k plus this thing here. OK? Well, that's a cubic. Uh, the characteristic polynomial here are simply the root, uh, are, well, sorry, the characteristic frequencies are the roots of this polynomial. That's the roots of this polynomial. That's a cubic. And of course, it depends on k. Now, if k equals 0, I can, I can sure tell you what the roots of this are. That's the open loop system, and the roots are minus 10, minus 5, minus 3.33. OK? Now, as k increases, the roots change. There is a formula, of course, for the roots of a, of a third degree equation, which I, d I had no intention of using. I just worked it out for you here. So here's the way it works. When k is 0, that's open loop system. The poles are minus 10, minus 5, minus 3.33. When it's 1, it's these numbers. And here's the interesting part, is these are, uh, these are complex. And what you want to look at here is how fast the system responds. Here, the dominant pole is minus 3. Here, it's minus 2. Um, at 3, it's minus 1. At 10, look what's happening. It's actually, you have plus minus 10j, 
These are pure imaginary. That says that when the feedback gain is 10, you actually have pure oscillatory response there. And we saw, that's exactly what we saw. When k is 12, you have oscillatory response with a growing term. That's positive. And for 15, you have a larger growing term and a slightly faster frequency. Now, what people do is they often plot this on a complex plane. They show the three poles, in this case, or the poles of the system. That's here, here, and here. And then these are simply plotted as, as a function of k, as a curve. This pole moves to the left. It gets faster. And these poles do something very interesting. They move in together. While they're moving in together, by the way, good things are happening. The system is becoming faster. Okay? When they get together, they break apart and become complex. And sure enough, for large enough k, they, they go into the right half plane, and, and, you have, um, and, and you have this oscillatory response. So that's the idea. Now, in fact, this plot, this phenomenon, these are extremely general. This is, this is quite general. It happens in almost all applications of feedback are limited by issues involving stability and dynamics. So that's true for amplifiers. It is true in automatic control. It's true in lots and lots of fields, lots of areas of, of, of feedback. And delay and dynamics are what, what kills you in many cases. OK, so this brings us to the question of how about determining whether the, if I'm doing design, I have a parameter like k, and I want to know when, when do I like the, pole, the zeros of this? which are going to be my closed loop poles. When do I like the zeros? And of course, I, if it's just something like this, it's simple enough. I can just try a bunch of values of k and decide what I like and don't like. Okay? But it, it turns out there, there's some good things to, a few good things to know about this, and we'll, we'll actually mention those, uh, those, those now. So, and actually, we, we've only done this for the second order case, so now we get to look at the higher order case. It looks like this. You have a transfer function rational, and when is it stable? Well, it only depends on when the polynomial A has its roots in the left half plane. That's, that's the critical part. We want to know whether the real parts of the poles are negative. Now, if you're given the factored form, and I ask you, is this thing stable? It's very easy. You check whether all the P's have negative real part. That's extremely simple. But what if you're given the coefficients like this? And in fact, that's exactly the case here. We're sort of given the coefficients. Well, you have to factor it. If it's quadratic, no problem. Cubic, we've already discussed this a bunch of times. What if it's bigger? And um, I should mention also that if these were specific numbers, we can easily factor this. Uh, for example, you can do it in MATLAB. You just type roots of a polynomial. It comes back and takes five milliseconds, and you have the roots. Okay? So that wasn't true 100 years ago, but, uh, or, or even 30 or 40. Um, but that's, uh, that's it. But in this case, we're interested in design, where there, there might be one or more parameters in here. And that, that gets more tricky, um, like this one. And so what we really want is some kind of general idea about when are the roots of this, wh when are they in the left half plane. And it turns out that's a famous problem. Um, it was posed, in fact, in around 1820, if you can believe it. And it came out of the Industrial Revolution, and in fact, let me, it actually led to the first paper on control theory. And it, it came from something very practical. And what it was was, uh, it was certain re uh, mechanical regulators that were being built for steam engines and things like that. So it was mechanical regulators. And they worked very nicely. In other words, when the pipe was going too fast, um, all that happened was the steam pipe got restricted. Less power went to the engine, and things slowed down. What more was there to say? Nothing. And it worked. And they made hundreds of these, and it worked, and they were critical to, in fact, the Industrial Revolution. OK, what happened was, and then by 1820, 1830, machining got a lot better. And so these regulators and all the linkages they were building were being manufactured much better. And the result was that these uh, regulators, or servos, went unstable. They went unstable. And no one knew why. And they had a name for it. They called it hunting. And this was a terrible thing. Hunting meant that the poor machine couldn't figure out what it was doing. In other words, it would kind of, the speed of the shaft would kind of drop, and then it would go up, and then it would go down, and then up. And so they called that 
or just hunting for its speed. I don't know. That's, that's the term. It goes back to 1830. And it was a big problem. And people were really bummed out, especially because what brought on this terrible perform behavior was, in fact, an improvement in the manufacturing. So they built better parts, and the thing basically messed up. Okay, so you can imagine people were very, very disappointed about this. And uh, this is actually the first time it act people actually needed any control theory, because up till then, you didn't need any. Because basically, control theory up until about 1830 went like this. If the shaft goes too fast, right, then the steam pipe will be constricted. Less steam will go to the steam engine, and the shaft will slow down. Okay? If the shaft goes too slow, the steam, the, 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 the valve will be opened, and more steam will go, and it'll speed up. Okay? Any more questions? That's it. That was the state of control theory in 1830. That's in fact the state, that was actually the state of control theory for the 2,000 years leading up to 1830. That was the state of control theory. Okay. All that changed when by putting in fancy gimbaled linkages, the old theory didn't cut it anymore because they turned the whole thing on and it would go, basically go unstable and it would just sit there and it would do what they called hunting. Okay? So that, that's actually when control theory was started because people tried to figure out why on earth is this. And that's the first time people wrote down some differential equations to try to understand why it wasn't working anymore and why their 2,000 year old explanation of feedback was no longer working. In other words, the simplistic description. Um, and in fact, it, it emerged a few years later. They figured out that it all depended on a, on a certain polynomial, which they called the characteristic polynomial. That's the first thing. Uh, oh, and I might add, you, you might guess who wrote this first paper, and it was James Clerk Maxwell, wrote the first paper on control theory. And he identified, he said that the reason, that whether or not this thing works or oscillates or what it does depends on this weird polynomial, this characteristic polynomial. And if the roots are in the left half plane, well, the solution does something. And if it's in the right half plane, it actually grows, and that's very bad. Okay, so that's now, of course, basic material. It's, it's part of 102. You don't even think about it anymore, it's so obvious. Uh, but this is groundbreaking news in, you know, in, in, this, in this era. Um, and then people understood. They understood exactly what happened. They had made the machines better. Certain damping terms, which had been present when the mechanics was really crappy, were gone. And the result was, you know, the characteristic polynomial, a couple of coefficients got a little bit smaller than they were before because of improvements in manufacture, and boom, a couple of roots went into the right half plane, and you had hunting. So, okay, so we're, uh, we're done. So we'll, we'll quit here, and then uh, I guess continue on, on Friday. <laughs>